So I want to thank Roger and Chris Pinnell and the past editors of the uh, Oxfordian and Alex McNeil, uh, the people who actually publish the works that we uh, present in our research. Uh, that is really where the gold is. Coming here is a wonderful thing. There's a silver lining to coming to conferences because you get to hobnob with people and have a great time. But truly, the work is being done. It's going into print and going online. So I think those are the really the people who are really helping us out and why I, my research was based on the willingness of editors, including Stephanie Hughes initially and, and the two Michaels and Gary Goldstein and others to uh, uh, give me license to continue with my research on Shakespeare's Greek sources, which I've engaged in for about a dozen years, starting with the tragedies of Hamlet and Macbeth and then going through the romances and the uh, comedies and it kind of eventually studying the works of Aristophanes and, and uh, Asophocles and Aeschylus, Euripides has led led me to kind of what I'm going to present today, which is a rehash to a little, little extent, a revisioning of work that I presented here in 2008 and 2009 at our, at our conferences uh, on uh, Timon of Athens and Troilus and Cressida. Uh, I have particular uh, gratitude to Nina Green. Again, we've got Nina's name up several times because of her uh, Oxford authorship site. Uh, she has textual evidence on that site that I used uh, that I could not make this presentation without Nina's uh, uh, support. Uh, and so I really owe it to her. The first third of it is going to be talking about publications in 1584 that have some intertextual connection. The middle part will be talking about Timon and Troilus as satires, and the final part will be looking at Oxford, an Oxfordian interpretation of these two plays that, that might be uh, pertinent to his life in 1584. Uh, really, uh, what I'm using here is uh, a, a intertextual argument that's based to a large extent, to a significant extent, on a, a, a paradigm that Robert Maiola wrote about in Shakespeare, Italy, and intertextuality. He talks about the importance of intertext and the different types of intertext there are. For instance, one would be revision, where an author goes back and rewrites like Hamlet, gets revised from first to second quarto. Then you have translation, a direct translation from a Greek or Latin source into English. Then you have quotation. Then you have question of sources. Was there a source uh, associated with this particular play? Did, did, did Shakespeare use Seneca, or did he use some other uh, source to write these particular plays? Is there, are there analogs, uh, echoes that prove source? And of course, source goes beyond plot, character, ID, language, rhetorical style, genre, uh, conventions, configuration. So there's a number of things he identifies. But what I'm going to be talking about today is the issue of paralogs. What he calls paralogs are the related texts, commentaries, letters, and derivative publications that reflect on what is being contemporaneously being published or produced in the theaters. And so you have a horizontal rather than a vertical temporal complex. I hope not to engage in what Myola gave as a caveat that I will not give rampant, irresponsible association, facile cultural generalization, and anecdotal impressionistic historicizing, as we know Stephen Greenblatt and others are, have, have committed in the past. So. I'm going to begin this by talking a little bit about Timon of Athens specifically, and why is Timon so interesting to us. There were a, a very, very small number of literary references to Timon in the uh, latter half of the 16th century. And these, this list I, I get from John Jowett's edition of Timon, which is an excellent edition, and which uh, is, was the key to my understanding of how this might work. And we're going to be focusing on two works here, William Warner's Syrinx and Robert Greene's Guidonius. And this is available, the text of this is available on Nina Greene's website. Now, Lily uh, re refers to Timon and that his problem, his misanthropy, is based on envy. It's kind of an interesting thing, but he is mentioned in Euphues. But I'm going to focus mostly on Warner and Greene. And look at these other uh, differences. They all have some connection, all these authors, to the Earl of Oxford. It's kind of interesting. And this is a quote from the To the Reader section of the 1584 edition of Pan His Syrinx, or a Sevenfold History, by William Warner. And yet, let his coy prophetess presage hard events in her cell, let the Athenian misanthropos, or man-hater, bite on the stage, or the Sinopian cynic bark at the stationer, yet in pan his syrinx will I pipe at least to myself. Now, this isn't the To the Reader of the 84 edition. It's republished in the 90s, and it's completely rewritten. It's completely different. So this is a temporal reference to characters in 1584, in an exact echo of lines from Timon I am misanthropos and hate mankind. So you see the word associations there. Now, the misanthropos in Warner's thing was actually printed in Greek ca characters, which I could not reproduce on my computer. Now, who is he referring to in this? Well, the coy prophetess, of course, is Cassandra. She would be a character, possibly, in the history of Agamemnon and Ulysses, performed at court by the Earl of Oxford's boys in 1584. 
All right, well, we know that uh, the misanthropos biting on the stage is obviously a reference to a satire about Timon of Athens. There's no other way to interpret that particular line. And then the last uh, reference is to the Sinopian cynic barking at the stationer. Well, Diogenes Sinope is the cynical philosopher from Sinope, it's a Sinopian cynic, and barking at the stationer would reference that Lily's play was published in 1584, referencing the stationer's guilt. So these are all topical 1584 references references that we're going to be playing with, and we're going to tie these three plays together over and over and over again in a web of illusions that includes Robert Greene. Uh, we'll get to him soon. Okay, so these are interesting, and so we're looking horizontally in 1584, and we'll be covering three different publications from that year. Now, who is William Warner? Well, he published Syrinx in 84. He also wrote Albion's England, for which he's much greater uh, recognized, and he did a, a, a translation from the Latin edition of Menechmi in, in uh, 1595, which is, of course, the source of uh, to, uh, a Comedy of Errors. Francis Muir refers to him, oh, Thomas Nash praises him as one of the great poets, one of the great, you know, lyrical poets of that time. Muir calls him our English Homer, as Euripides is the most sententious among the Greek poets, so is Warner among our English poets. And yet he only had these three publications that come down to us. Uh, Syrinx's sources include Cooper's Chronicle, it's modeled on he Heliodorus's Ethiopica, and it, it's, it's a euphuistic novel. It's modeled on Lily's use of euphuism. And so is Green's novel, Guidonius, a euphuistic novel. So these are two euphuistic novels published the same year. Okay, um, and Ovid's Metamorphoses is the uh, source of much of the material that's in the to the reader section. You'll have to kind of look at that. I can't really go into that. Now, in Albion's England, which was published later in the early 17th century, he also references Timon and compares him to Robin Hood. And in a later edition, he describes him as a land stripped gentleman, grew thenceforth shy of women, and a Timon unto man. Man, so Warner was was very interested in Timon. He mentions him at least three different times in different publications. Unusual when you look at the dearth of references to Timon in the late uh, 16th century. This is uh, from the preface in Syrinx, and this is, the, this is a kind of a key issue here. In the preface to the second edition of Syrinx, he pointedly accuses two writers of having plagiarized stories from his novel. One of them is almost explicitly designated by the punning allusion to his name, that scholar and pregnant writer on whose grave the grass now groweth green. It is unquestionable a reference uh, uh, to the popular and influential Robert Greene. Now we're going to go on to Greene's Guidonius. So Guidonius published, same year, and that's the uh, frontispiece from that. Uh, so what about Guidonius? Now it's dedicated to the Earl of Oxford. How wonderful is that? This is a quote from his dedication. All that courted At Atlanta were hunters, and none sued to Sappho but poets. Wheresoever Messenus lodgeth, there, no doubt, will scholars flock. And your honor, being a worthy favor and foster of learning, hath forced many, through their exquisite virtue, to offer the first fruits of their study at the shrine of your lordship's courtesy. Now, he received another a beautiful dedication from John Southern also in 1584, so and acknowledging his knowledge of astronomy and philology and all these things. So, uh, Oxford is really on a roll in 84 in terms of receiving these things. Now this comes from the dedication to uh, uh, Green's uh, book. So he's, he's to the reader, in both Warner and in Green, Pan is mentioned in the first sentence. So Pan, his syrinx, is about the, the Pan flute. The, the seven reeds of the flute are their seven stories, and that's why he's using that model. That's why uh, Warner uses that model. But here's Green also referencing Pan at the beginning of his. Now, where does Pan come into the story of Guidonius? There's nothing hardly about Pan in the story whatsoever. So it's Pan blowing on his oak and pipe a little homely music and hearing no man dispraise his small cunning began both to play so loud and so long that they were more weary of hearing his music than he in showing his skill, till at last to claw him and excuse him themselves, they said his pipe was out of tune. Now, could this be a reference that Green is referencing Warner back and forth? There's another reference to Pan in, 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 uh, in Guidonius. Uh, there's a line in which the heroine says to what, Guidonius, do you think to be a free man in Wales by offering a leak to St. David, or to bring Pan into a fool's paradise by praising his pipe? So there's several references to Pan's pipe in Green's book, okay? So I'm saying this is a paralogue. This is a connection between two literary works published in the same year. Regrettably, Guidonius was published before Syrinx. Now maybe 
Green knew something about what was going on in Warner's circle and where he was publishing. Uh, but anyway, I think these are related texts. We're going to look at Godonius quickly here. Um, now, he does reference the same three characters that, that, that uh, Warner references. Cassandra, uh, he's uh, from uh, Agamemnon and Ulysses, possibly. Um, and then you have uh, Alexander the Great and Apelles and Diogenes, who are referenced from Campaspe. They're characters in Campaspe. We have two references to Agamemnon, two to Ulysses, two to Paris, and one each of Troilus and Cressida in uh, Guidonius, and also two references to Timon of Athens. So I'm saying both authors are referencing some of the very same characters that may have appeared in these plays that we're seeing uh, were performed at court. Now, what is the, the, the two texts you will quotes that I have regarding Guidonius's references to Timon. Well, one of them, I think, it really defines a Shakespearean Timon. Ah, but I let the blasphemous beast that I am thus recklessly to rail and rage without reason. And of course, it's all alliterative, euphemistic language. Thus churlessly to exclaim against those without whom our life, though never so luckily, could seem most loathsome. Thus, Timon like to condemn those heavenly creatures whose only sight is sufficient solve against all hellish sorrows. He's talking about women here. Okay, he's talking about a woman he's in love with who's not returning his favors. Um, and so if you look at the literary history of Timon of Athens, there's only one author. Uh, Plutarch doesn't do this, Lucian doesn't do this, Shakespeare does it, that the women are insulted. The two prostitutes that come with Alcibiades in Act Four are uh, railed against by Timon of Athens. No other reference in the Timon literature that I've looked at references his relationship, his painting, pain relationship with women. So I think that makes it a Shakespearean kind of reference. And of course, he's talking about recklessly to rail and rage without reason. And that's Shakespeare's Timon. Of, of, of all the characteristics of Timon, he is a railer. Okay, and the second reference is uh, a slightly less, more general reference that, uh, in fine, he seemed rather a Timon than a gentleman of Alexandria, that he was off by himself in the woods. So it's a very simple reference to Timon. So he has two references that brings Timon in to attach his image to two of the characters that are in the, in the, uh, in the novel. Now, briefly, the novel, the story is that of a prodigal son, uh, Guidonius. Uh, he was beautiful, he was comely, he is amiable, he is a heavenly creature and a mortal conqueror, and yet, a mind blemished of detestable quality, spotted with the stain of voluptuousness, endued with vanity and imbrued in vice, neither the dread of God's wrath nor the fear of his father's displeasure could drive him to desist from his detestable kind of living. In fact, so carelessly he was floated in the seas of voluptuousness and so recklessly raged in licentiousness and lawless liberty, using such monstrous access in all his actions, including the language, um, in the very pattern of witless prodigality. Finally, because of his outrageous behavior, the magistrates cast him in prison where he lay clogged with care and devoid of comfort, having not so much as one trusty friend among all, amongst all those trotless flatterers, which in prosperity had so frequented his company, his ingratitude of whom so perplexed his molested mind. Now, is this not a time and setup? It's exactly the situation that Timon's in. Living prodigally, busted, no support. This is exactly the, the dramatic situation. So, same year, Different outcome. One's a romance and one's a satire. Going in different directions, I believe. So after he gets out of prison, he spends 10 days in prison, kind of like what Oxford did when he went to the tower. All right, 10 days, he specifies that. He vows to seek for wisdom, to make amends, to heap not care upon care, nor add on grief to sorrow by those that, thy pitiful complaints. But cheer up thyself and take heart, for the end of woe is the beginning of weal, and after misery always ensueth most happy felicity. So he's just flipped it over. So he follows the path of virtue, goes on to Alexandria, uh, saves the day, unites the kingdoms, marries the princess. It's a great romance in the end. That's, that's a summary of the plot of Guidonius. Now here's a very interesting commentary on that by Richard Dent, published a few years ago. Green, by the standards of any age, was a plagiarist and a plagiarist by the carload in his early novels. During his period of literary apprenticeship, he was not, no conscientious apprentice. Rather, he was a literary quilt maker. How many works helped make Guidonius? I do not know. But two of the major ones that were his earlier, Mamilia and, and Petty's uh, Petty Palace. And he puts on long passages, almost absolutely verbatim transcriptions. Okay? So he's doing a paralogic uh, 
you know, uh, grabbing of pieces from other works and piecing them together for Gordonius. And in fact, in other works, he also is beholden uh, to, Robert Greene is beholden to William Warner, okay? Uh, Albion's England is a source of some, some things in, the, in Menophon, okay? Uh, and several other of his, of his novels were also based on narrative stories, language that's in Syrinx. Now, both of these are based on the Heliodoran model. Of course, the Earl of Oxford in 1569 received the dedication of Thomas Underwood's translation of Heliodorus. So it all ties together very beautifully. And they're all using Lillian kind of euphuistic uh, uh, language in both these, uh, all these stories. Now, what about one other thing? Now, here's a very interesting image of Lord Burley, William Cecil, on the cover of Twain's Time in the Bath. Now, why is he there? You know, he, he's, he's, a, he's one of the characters who ain't going to pay for time to get bailed out, okay? I don't know why A.D. Nutt, I'll put him on the cover there, but it's amazing. And I want to look at Burley's precepts, because there's something very interesting. Precepts were originally available in manuscript form circa 1584, okay? So there, there were actually copies of this circulating around in the inner circle. It wasn't published until you know, the second uh, decade of the 17th century. But these were circulating in manuscript form, according to uh, the editor of the edition that I had, uh, one of the great Folger scholars. I'll, I'll, I'll show you who I'm talking about in a minute here. But so he had these certain precepts that were made available in a variety of manuscript forms. Uh, and of course, he was the uh, kind of the mentored all these young, you know, rising aristocrats who were going to enter the government and, and, in England, except for the Earl of Oxford, of course. But Oxford, Rutland, and Southampton were all his wards. And we'll hear more about wardship uh, as, as time goes on here. But Lewis Wright, the gentleman who was somewhat uh, given a bad reputation in some discourse yesterday, he says this about this uh, in his introduction to these. Um, to, to Burley's precepts. The regimen prescribed by Burley for the young men was strict and included not only French, Latin, cosmology, writing, drawing, exercises of the pen, and dancing, but the reading of the epistles and gospel before dinner in English and after dinner in Greek. Now, I've never seen a quote directly supporting my analysis of why the Earl of Oxford went to the Greek church, knew the Greek stuff, knew the Greek literature. Uh, but here he is, Louis Wright, he's, he's my favorite guy. So now what I'm gonna do is I wanna compare precept passages from Burley and Green. Guidonius has, 5% of the text of Guidonius is precepts given by Guidonius' father or by Castania's father, the heroine's father. So two fathers are giving advice on the raising of sons and daughters. And I'm just gonna show you the parallel thematic elements between what Green was writing in this novel and what Burley's precepts have. So I gotta get about five points of quick comparison. This is a divergent, I'm just saying, eh, maybe there's a, a relationship here, maybe not. So Burley says, let thy hospitality be barred and according to the measure of thine own uh, estate, rather plentiful than sparing, but not too costly, for I never knew any grow poor by keeping an orderly table. Green says this, be not too sumptuous, lest thou seem prodigal, nor too covetous, lest thou seem uh, th 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 count thee a niggard. For by spending in excess, thou shalt be thought of a glorious fool, and by too much sparing, a covetous peasant. Kind of interesting parallel there on what to do with your money. Um, be kind and kindred to allies. B be welcome at thy table, but shake off those glowworms. Um, mean parasites and sycophants who feed and fawn upon thee in the summer of prosperity. And then here's what, here's what Green is saying. Be a friend to all and a foe to none, and yet trust not without trial, nor commit any secret to a friendly stranger, lest in too much trust lie treason. Then beware, lest fair words make fool feign and glossing speeches cause had I wit come too late. So don't uh, get caught up in the flattery that you're gonna get. Bring thy children up in learning and obedience, yet without austerity. Praise them openly, reprehend them secretly. Give them good countenance and convenient maintenance according to thy ability. So this is raising up and the educating of your child by Burley. And here's what Green is saying. Let thy daughter spend her time in reading such ancient authors as may sharpen her wit by their pithy sayings and learn her wisdom by their perfect sentences. For where nature is vicious, by learning it is amended. Now, here comes two good ones. This is about who to marry. Use great providence, this is what Burley says, and circumspection in the choice of thy wife. Let her not be poor, neither choose a base and uncomely creature altogether for wealth, for it will cause contempt in others and loathing in thee. For make no choice of a dwarf or a fool, for from the one shall may, mayest thou beget a race of pygmies. 
and other may be thy daily disgrace, for it will irk thee to have her talk. Okay. All right. Now, we're talking the kind of advice you give to a, to a late teenager, to, an, to a college student age, okay? I don't know about this, but I think, I think Green's got it better. Okay, he says this, be not dazzled by the beams of fading beauty, nor daunted by the desire of every delicate damsel, for in such bliss will prove thy bane, and such delightful joy, but despiteful annoy. Lust, Guidonius, will prove thy enemy in thy purse, and a foe to thy person, a canker to thy mind, and a corrosive to thy conscience, a weakener of thy wit, a molester of thy mind. And he goes on and on and on about this. Think about Oxford and Ann Vavasar a few years earlier. Yes, lust. Fine. Finally, this is the best. Suffer not thy sons to pass the Alps, for they shall learn nothing but pride, blasphemy, and atheism. And if by travel they attain to some few broken language, they will profit them no more than to have one meat served in diverse dishes. Don't learn the vernacular languages. Don't go south of the Alps. Please don't do what the Oxford guy did, OK? Here's what, Gui, here's what Green's saying. In my opinion, Guidonius, the fittest kind of life for a young gentleman to take is to spend his time in travel, <laughs> wherein he shall find both pleasure and profit, yea, and by that, by experience, which otherwise with all the treasure in the world he cannot purchase. For what changes vanity to virtue, staleless wit to staid wisdom, fond fantasies to firm affection, but travel. So you see there's thematic parallels here. The language isn't exactly the same. But the idea is we've hit five different elements of Burley's precepts, of, of the many precepts he has major ones, on, and Green is doing the same thing contemporaneous with the re, uh, availability of Burley's precepts in larger circle. Okay, so that's the first third. Whew, got through that. I hope we're doing okay on time. Ooh. All right, let's go. Ah, Life of Tim Timon of Athens is a Greek satire. Now, Timon of Athens is a painful play to see produced. We, those people who came to Ashland this year really suffered, but I you know, thank you for coming. But you know, Chambers thinks that he's having a nervous breakdown. Um, Draper says, and I agree with him, a fierce and sweeping indictment of the ideals and social ethics of the age. Time depicts the economic ruin of the nobility. Yeah. Okay. And what about time? Well, in my paper that was published in the Oxford in 2009, I talk about the sources and also the Greek elements primarily. I focus on that. But really, Campaspe turns out to be a source of Shakespeare's time. In. And in one small way, we'll, we'll, we'll come upon that. So Camp has to be, again, being tied back into the circle of those three plays we, we, we launched at the beginning. But there are numerous Greek dramatic elements. Timon basically is a three-part sequence. Uh, it's, it's like a trilogy. Many Greek tropes and images as cork, commentaries, and prophecy, madness, and I believe satire, we'll, we'll find. Apamantus, the, the philosopher, the, the cynic philosopher in um, Timon, he closely resembles Diogenes in Lily's Campaspe, much more closely, in fact, than uh, Diogenes and Lucian Sala philosophers. And Bate and Rasmussen make the same thing, a, a statement in their Norton edition, or not Norton, whatever edition they um, had. The character of Apamantus may also be indebted to the misanthropic philosopher Diogenes in Lily's comedy Campaspe. So there's a connection between Apamantus and Diogenes in these two plays perform the same year. Okay. Now here's from the life of Antony uh, from Plutarch. Uh, I think this is Drayton's uh, uh, translation. This time it was a citizen of Athens and lived much about the Peloponnesian War, as may be seen in the comedies of Aristophanes and Plato, in which he is ridiculed as hater and enemy of mankind. He avoided and repelled the approaches of everyone, but embraced with kisses and the greatest affection Alcibiades then in his hot youth. So we're saying, he knew there were, there were satires written about Timon. Aristophanes was mocking Timon in a play we no longer have. We have a number of Aristophanes plays, but we don't have anyone about Timon. But Plutarch's telling us Aristophanes wrote about Timon. Okay, contemporaneous satires on this crazy guy that was going around putting everybody down and hating mankind. And Plato, Plato early in his career was also a playwright. I didn't know that, but apparently, uh, it's, it's true. I couldn't find any textual uh, support that, that, that had passages from Platonic uh, uh, theatrical output, but uh, there are several authors that have confirmed that, that what, what uh, Plutarch's saying. Now, Lucian is the other really main source of the Timon story. Almost all the plot comes from Lucian's satire on Timon the Misanthrope. Um, his verbal familiarity with literature, this is about Lucian, attested to by his constant quotations from Homer, Hesiod, and Pindar, and his frequent reminiscences of Thucydides, Xenophon, Plato, and Demosthenes, 
His genius as much in common with that of Aristophanes to whom he repeated refers. So Lucian is, is copying Aristophanes in, a, in writing satires, okay? And he's using all these other Greek authors for sources and plot, uh, elements to put in there, just like Shakespeare. Uh, so Shakespeare is reenacting and reinventing Lucian, I believe, in his play as a satire. Lucian's satires are inherently theatrical and combined with a biting critique of individualism, self-seeking pursuit of individual wealth also pervades the Aristophanic corpus. So we see Lucian and Aristophanes having a connection, and I believe, based on my analysis of old comedy, that Timon and Troilus are clearly modeled on that old comedy, Aristophanic, politically loaded satire. Okay? The plot for Timon's prodigality, his flatterers, his poverty, his exile from Latin, uh, Athens, all come from Lucian. His discovery of gold while digging, all this stuff out of Lucian. And then the series of flattering supplicants, which is very much a model of Arist Aristophanic comedy. You see the latter part of his plays, you see a series of people coming on the stage and getting beat up by the protagonist or insulted or given wealth or something. They, they all get a little bit different treatment. But this is, a, this is a convention of Aristophanic political satire of old comedy. So. Uh, other things that come from Lucian, the animal imagery, there's lots of animals mentioned in Timon and that come right out of Lucian. His ironic pretense of offering help to the Athenians, oh, we'll give them gold, but you know, he's paying Alcibiades to go and ruin Athens and, and of course the prostitutes that he brings along, that she'll, they'll do more damage yet. Um, his fall from grace is in Lucian, so numerous ver verbal parallels. There was no English edition of Lucian available. There was a Latin edition uh, co-authored by Erasmus and Thomas More, published almost 100 years earlier. Uh, there were Latin and French editions. So how did Shakespeare get Lucian? Th that nobody really satisfactorily explains that. And here's an interesting thing that is in Pallidus Tamia regarding uh, satire. As Horace, Lucilius, Juvenal, Perseus, and Lucullus are the best for satire among the Latins. Now, Lucilius and Lucullus are two characters, named characters in Timon. And he also has Vero as a character in Timon. And Vero is another satirist, another Latin satirist. So he's got three Latin satirists in the uh, Dram Dramatis Personae. So he's pointing over and over again, Shakespeare is, that, that, that this is a satire. It's to be interpreted as a satire. Now, what is the genre of Timon? Well, you have widely disparate uh, opinions on this. Uh, uh, O.J. Campbell, I think, has written the best work on this in terms of, he calls it a tragical satire, and I really agree with him. But you see all the other uh, 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 idiots comedy, late tragedy, indeterminate, tragical pageant, whatever you want to call it, it has elements of lots of things. And John Ruskowitz, who wrote an annotated uh, time and bibliography, which is outstanding uh, collection, uh, a really good reference, uh, is a play conceived in tragedy, but incorporating elements of morality, comedy, far satire, mask and pageant, but Swinburne calls it like in the great and terrible fourth act of time, and it's almost like I have juvenile, the satirist juvenile, might have written when half deified by the spirit of Aeschylus. So we're talking about tragical satire here. What is the most immediately evident, the play's most extensive source material, is its satirical uh, dimensions, what Jowett says in his Oxford, Oxford edition. And he's grounded in satire, yet it is not straightforwardly satirical. Well, anyway, so that's what I want to say. Finally, uh, how much time do I have, John? Until 10.30? Oh, good. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be okay here, I think. Whew. Okay. Uh, Campbell says this about why an audience at that time would know that time is a satire. Not only because maybe they had read Lucian, those educated who were enough to understand how that works. An Elizabethan audience, vividly aware of the dangers of flattery, saw at once in Timon's response to this adulation, not generosity, but self-satisfaction at the display of his munificence. The disposal of his largesse is touched with vanity and ostentation. We realize that Timon's good and gracious nature is but his false friend's euphemism for uh, prodigality. Euphemism for prodigality. Okay. Apomantus does not enlist our respect for Timon. On the contrary, he keeps us from being dazzled by the deceptive splendor, which might cause us to mistake pretentious parade for noble generosity. And Shakespeare calls time a naked gull, a term used over and over again among satirists. He is completely a slave to his misanthropy. His propensity to vituperate is always beyond his control. The railing, again. And he says, finally, and this is how we're going to tie some of this together. Notably, Troilus and Cressida and Timon of Athens are not only filled with a harsh spirit of formal satire, but in construction, they also display distinguishing characteristics of the genre. Consequently, their somber tone and their disillusioned temper have always been taken as a proof of the author's personal unhappiness at the verge of despair. So what are the 
things that tie time and Troilus together that other authors have seen. What Kreisig could call the bitter scorn which in Troilus and Cressida permeates the conception of every human relationship we meet again only in Timon. And, and Harbage says, in only two of the 38 plays do the defective characters outnumber the rest, Timon and Troilus. So again, the, the parallels between these two plays are quite remarkable. There's, they both have genre issues that are indeterminate according to a variety of scholars, but I believe we could say that they're, they both have such elements of satire that we have to go that way. There's a pervasive cynicism, disparate critical opinions, probably both performed at, at the ends of court. The, many scholars have suggested that these plays were you know, written for a more sophisticated audience, ma mainly lawyers. Um, Adomalous placement in the first folio. Timon is put in the folio where Troilus was supposed to be, and Troilus is not in the index, and it's, it's inserted between the tragedies and the histories. So Troilus was inserted, it was a very late addition to the, to the first folio, and it's unpaginated. So there's a, there's a relationship between these two plays in their actual physical location in the folio. They both use Greek dramatic elements, they both have extensive choric commentaries, and I believe they both rent, render personal and political allegories. So let's look at the history of Agamemnon. Ulysses, we know, is performed, which uh, has been suggested uh, by Loney and others, that is probably an early version of what becomes Troilus and Cressida. So that's, I'm going to argue, I, I'm going to take that and run with that one. That's my outrageous jump in historicizing these two plays. So Loney says, you know, that they probably were uh, the same play. J.T. Murray writes, before Loney was published, that the, tra the history of Agamemnon and Ulysses may have been written by the Earl of Oxford himself, for he was reckoned by Putin and Mears among the best for comedy of his time. Okay? So in a pre uh, uh, Loney commentary, somebody's actually saying the Earl of Oxford wrote this play. Uh, or quite possibly. Okay, so we're going to traditionally, Troilus is dated around 1600. Um, it was registered in 1603, but not published until 1609. Uh, there's a question of the, is it a political allegory? Every commentary on Troilus looks at the Essex and Essex Rebellion and Essex relationship with the court and queen as being emblemized, allegorized in this play. Uh, his Achillean virtues, which is what he received, the dedication of Chapman's Achilles shield. And so the references to Achilles in the play may be references to the Earl of Essex. Uh, he was arrogant and disobedient, much like Achilles is in, in uh, Homer and in, uh, in Shakespeare. Here's what Tucker Brooks says, and I think it's very interesting commentary, um, although he's imagining this having been written in the early 17th century. I cannot help imagining that Shakespeare is anatomizing the England of the dying Elizabeth within the wall, the febrile Essex type of decadent sh chivalry without the stride and go-getters of the newer dispensations, Cecil Ulysses and Raleigh Diomed. I take it that Shakespeare glimpsed somehow the seriousness of the cleavage between Cavalier and Puritan. And here's what Bevington says. David Bevington's edition of Troilus and Cressida really is outstanding. I really uh, think that his Arden edition is the best. And he really makes the point that Troilus' depiction of insolent and divided leadership in time of war is a reflection of contemporary disillusionment with some of England's governing elite. Is that possible? These questions depend upon and can perhaps help determine the date of the play's composition and it performed its performances. So the date of composition determines how you interpret this. And we're going back to 1584. We've already talked a little bit about the publication anomalies, how the grand possessors attempted to suppress this, this information, um, and we're going on with what Bevington's commentaries on the genre. The evident last minute decision to insert the play in an anomalous location between the histories and tragedies appears to underscore the play's generic indeterminacy. So th even, the, even the publishers of the Cordo and the Folio seem not to know what to call it. It was called the history, and then there's the tragical history, and that's inserted you know, between the histories and the tragedies. So, you know, it, it, it defies standard uh, uh, abbreviations. Uh, Swinburne declares it to be a hybrid. Yeats and John Cott refer to it as a tragic comedy. Northrop Fry calls it hard to fit into any genre. Comedy, history, tragedy, romance, because it has so many elements of all four. Finally, this is Bevington. Troilus and Cressida is, moreover, a sophisticated play, highly satirical at times, experimental in genre, and attuned to an avant-garde idiom not unlike that of the private theater plays performed by the scandalous success by the voice actors. The intellectual rather than the emotional treatment of love and war in the play, along with its lengthy philosophical speeches and disillusioned treatment of romantic love, the ribald jesting, the direct allusions, the sexual looseness of the time, and the familiar tone all might be supposed to appeal to an audience 
residence at one of the inns of court, which had a reputation for indecorum. Homer's pro-Greek perspective gives way to a matter-of-fact view of war in which the few heroes, like Hector, are victimized by an all-engulfing conflict. Heather James, in her wonderful book on the subject, uh, talks about that how Shakespeare selects the least reputable versions of the characters and events and heightens their unsavory aspects. Ajax is far from Lydgate's hero, Achilles from Homer's, Troilus from Chaucer's, and Nestor from anybody's version. All that is obnoxious in Ovid's account of the Greeks is writ large in the dolts, Ajax, the Machiavellian politicians, and the thugs in Shakespeare's stage. Finally, O.J. Campbell says, look, the love story of Troilus and Cressida, from his first appearance in Benoit's Romain de Trois, has simulated a satiric attitude in most authors who have told it. So again, over and over and over again, we see Troilus, like Timon, as a satiric element. Now, we're going to look uh, over the last 15 minutes, oh gosh, we're almost there, at Earl of Oxford as the author, 1584, what's going on? Why would he write Timon? What is his motive to writing Troilus at those times? We're looking at motive now and connection. Well, obviously, here's, a, here's an image of Timon from uh, uh, beautiful, what Timon's dispensing gold to Phrynia and Timandra and Alcibiades. And the, the presence of the dog in this image is a clear indication this is satire. Dogs mean satire, okay? Calling somebody a dog. It's, a, it's, it's, it's obviously a satiric reference in most cases. So he made beautiful gifts of jewels to the queen leading up th right through the early 1580s. Um, so he was giving away a lot of wealth during this time. And of course, between 1580 and 1585, he sold over 30 estates to keep this. In 84 alone, he sold 12 estates to fund what he was, how, his lifestyle and what uh, he was supporting in the uh, community. Now, De Vere, this is from uh, uh, Bill Farina's book. De Vere, like Timon, lavishly patronized poets, painters, jewelers, and merchants. He owned a basin in Ewer given to him by the queen in 1579. And in the play, when Timon's servant Flaminius entreats the two-faced Lucullus to loan his master money, Lucullus dreams, he says, they dream that Timon would present him with a silver basin and Ewer as a gift. Oh, that's a specific image that attaches to the Earl of Oxford in his role as the great Lord Chamberlain, okay? Um, that is uh, unmistakable, I think, an allusion to the Earl of Oxford. Now, w was he, you know, being ripped off? Well, uh, the, the testimony of, of Henry Locke says that the over-greedy horse leeches, which had sucked so ravenously of his sweet liberality. So, you know, his liberality, prodigality, yeah. Uh, and of course, Timon says, let all my lands be sold, which they already had, and he liquidated all these huge, huge number of estates in the first half of the 1580s. To pay for what? Well, he theatrical. Timon says, I entertain me with my own device. In other words, the mask of the Amazons at the end of the first part of Timon is Timon wrote the, tech, wrote the, wrote the script. This is his production, okay? So Timon considers himself a theater. Well, what is the role of Oxford? He's got Oxford's boys, he's got Oxford's men's, Oxford's musicians, and Oxford's acrobats. Four companies supporting going around England and in London performing various plays, even at court, okay? Now the poet says, and I got this from Roger, from a quote that Roger uh, shared with us this summer, and I forgot this was in the play, the poet near the end is approaching time and looking for some patronage. I am thinking that I shall say I have provided for him. It must be a personating, it must be a personating of him, a satire against the softness of propensity, of, of uh, prosperity. In other words, he's, he, the poet is coming to time and then saying, well, I'm gonna write a satire about all this. You know, you like that. You'll give me money for writing a satire about you, okay? Wow, I mean, that's, that's metaphoric language that really resonates. Elsabadi's plea for mercy and a military position posting for his hot-blooded friend uh, is one of the parts of the play that are poorly understood. All scholars say, what is that doing in there? It doesn't belong in that play. Well, why is this in there? Because it, you don't ever meet the guy that he's pleading for who's you know, killed somebody in a street fight. Oh, yeah, could be something. Anyway, I think it reflects on the trouble that Oxford was getting into with Anne Vavasar's family and the fights that his men and Thomas Nivett's men were having on the streets between in 1582 and 1583. So there were street fights, brawls going on. Three people, four people got killed during those fights. Oxford got wounded. You know, lots of bad stuff happened on the street, killing between these two men over a matter of honor, okay? 
And now, of course, the next year, Oxford did receive a commission to go with Norris to the Low Countries, although he was only there briefly. And here's what Alcibiades says. And I think he's talking, he's giving an apology. Earl of Oxford is writing an apology for what happened on the street during that uh, period of time when he and Vavasar's men were fighting. It pleases time and fortune to lie heavy upon a friend of mine who in hot blood has stepped into the law, which is past depth to those that without heed do plunge into it. He is a man setting aside, setting his fate aside of comely virtues. Nor did he soil the fact with cowardice and honor in him which buys out his fault. But with a noble fury and a fair spirit, seeing his reputation touched to death, he did oppose his foe and with such sober and unnoted passion he did behove his anger uh, uh, ere twas spent as if he had but proved an argument. You know, it was like, I, by honor, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for honorable section. Okay. Now, at that time, in a letter that we all probably are familiar with, dated in October of that year, Oxford admits to having entered into a great number of bonds in the sale of his lands with encumbrances earnestly requesting Burley to bail him out, his furtherance whereby he will unburden of a great care and which will save his honor. Burley, of course, doesn't come through for him. And in the PS, he says, I mean not to be your ward nor your child. I serve her majesty, and I am that I am, and by alliance near to your lordship, but free of, and scorn to be offered that injury, to think I am so weak of government as to be ruled by servants or not able to govern myself. And he's referring specifically to Burley's attempt to uh, subvert Lily into reporting, spying on Oxford. It, it, there's a clear indication that, that, that Burley has called Lily in and said, okay, you're going to have to start telling me what Oxford's up to because I don't like it. So let's get to Lily. Now, I think John Lilly is a good character that could stand for Flavius, the good servant in time and who's loyal to him in all respects. Now, he, he dedicated his Euphues as England in 1580 to Oxford. He held the lease at Blackfriars for several years, given to him by Oxford. Uh, his Greek themed comedy, Sappho and Phaeo and Capacity, were performed at court by Oxford's boys during this period. He was jailed in 1584 for failure to pay his bills, but the Queen forgave his debt, and the same year, Oxford gave an indenture that allowed him for a 30 pound annuity for in perpetuity, okay? So Oxford is setting up Lily 30 pounds a year. Now that's a pretty livable wage at that time you know, for a commoner uh, to survive on. So all these things kind of tie together, pointing at Oxford is going bust, but supporting his people the best that he could, and particularly John Lilly at, in that time. And of course, this is from Mark's book. If there is a hot ticket in London in 1583, Capacity was it. For here, court observers knew, was an exiled courtier's dramatic plea for royal forgiveness. Lilly's production gave De Vere the opportunity to argue that his scandalous affair with the temptress Anne Vavasar was now ancient history. Now we're going to go on to Anne Vavasar. This is an image from Troilus and Cressida. It's a tortured image, okay? Here's <laughs> Diomedes, who's taken possession of Cressida and will become her lover. Here is Troilus, outside the tent, listening into this conversation that's going spying on them. And of course, it's Ulysses, who's brought him to this place and, and restraining him so he can't go forward. Is there a dog in this image? I don't see one. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I, I love that image. So this is this is this is this is about Troilus. Okay, we're we're jumping into Troilus. Well, the Earl of Oxford fits the model of Troilus at this time in his life rather well. Of course, Troilus. You know, uh, I am that I am. You know, uh, nihil virius. Uh, nothing truer than truth. What truth can speak as truth, but truer than Troilus? True swains and love shall in the world to come approve their truth by Troilus, as true's authentic author to be cited, as true as Troilus shall crown up the verse. True, 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 Troilus. Over and over again, it's, it's tedious. But I think this is enough to con convince me that there's definitely a, a direct uh, uh, literary connection. Now, how about Anne Vavasar as Cressida, uh, as the character that, that's taken away from him? Well, she was introduced to court by Oxford's cousin, Henry Howard. Ooh, uh, he's got a role to play. She had, among other people, suitors, Edmund Spencer, Walter Raleigh, Edward de Vere, Henry Lee. They were all, all after this woman, you know? And by the time she was 20, she'd had two illegitimate children, okay? Um, 
uh, she was called perhaps the most remarkable aristocratic courtesan of the Elizabethan era. She's known for her clever, her wittiness, her caustic uh, attitude. Uh, and she says, Cressida says, by all Diana's waiting women yawned, and by herself I will not tell, et cetera, et cetera. Well, she was one of Elizabeth's waiting women, okay? So that's, she's kind of pointing at herself in that line. And of course, there's the echo poem that, that connects them. Uh, and, and, and Ulysses calls her a drab. Oh no, Cecil called her a drab, and Ulysses says, you know, she'll she'll come on to anybody. So so both Ulysses and, and William Cecil had a had a problem with it. So I think Ulysses is a stand in for for William Cecil, uh, the man man who's holding Troilus back there from from her from from Vavasar. Now many editors have associated Ulysses' speeches with uh, William or Robert Cecil. Because he's a spy master. He knows about secret correspondence between uh, Polyxena and Achilles. Is all that you have c c shared with Troy, we know. You know, we know your letters. So he's been spying. Uh, uh, he's got a spy group out there just like Cecil did. And of course, he was in conflict during that time with the Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. It was really ramping up in the, in the uh, run up to war with Spain, which began in 1588. Um, anyway, he's an old hand at gathering intelligence and deploying that information as a kind of elegant blackmail, according to David Bevington. So now th that makes Achilles r the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley. Now, of course, he was very close with Hatton and Philip Sidney, his nephew, who was uh, you know, his sidekick, uh, leader of the Protestant faction that wanted to go to war against Spain in the Low Countries. Uh, he was close to William of Orange, and he led the, the military expedition, uh, despite the Queen's hor hor the, the fact that he accepted the governorship of the, uh, you know, in, in Holland was, was a real terrible thing, according to Elizabeth, but he was out of control there, but he, he did go to Holland and was part of that war. And that's the same year that Leicester's Commonwealth comes out. So another publication, 1584, that ties in somehow to this. Commonwealth was a virulent, anonymous, best-selling libel, referring to Dudley as the Machiavellian master courtier. Both Walter Raleigh uh, and, and, and Henry Howard called him an arch intriguer. Camden referred to him as the evil genius of the court. So a lot of contemporaries saw right through. Of course, Sussex saw right through that, too. And the word factions is used co repeatedly in both Troilus and Leicester's Commonwealth. So factions is part of the, the problem that's going on in England. You, you hear that word over and over again when you read the historians. You had the Cecil faction versus the Leicester faction. Cecil, Sussex, Oxford. And then you had Hatton going back and forth between the two groups. He was originally associated with Cecil, and then he goes over to, to Leicester. Um, anyway, he was referred as insolent and, and impotent in his desire, and the word insolent and insolence is used repeatedly in relation to Achilles. So maybe there's a connection there, which would make his enemy, Hector, Achilles' enemy, Hector, Thomas Radcliffe, the Earl of Sussex, uh, who was a leading voice in opposition to Leicester. Uh, it, 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 and, and this goes back 20 years. In 1566, when Lester was moving on the Queen, Sussex uh, said, no, no, we can't do that, uh, that they actually wore yellow and purple ribbons at court, kind of like the War of the Roses kind of thing reenactment. They, they were always uh, uh, on each other's cases. He, of course, he virulently opposed English intervention in the Netherlands, uh, and he was also the, the Lord Chamberlain from 1572 till his death in 1583. Uh, now, in 83, he dies. So a year before this thing, uh, Hector, Radcliffe dies, and he says, I am now passing into another world and must leave you to your fortunes and to the queen's graces. But beware the gypsy, for he will be too hard on you all. You know not the beast so well as I do. Anyway, and then Frederick Flea says, on the death of Sussex in 83, his players probably entered the service of Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. I have no other way of confirming this. Is, you know, anybody else have some, is Flea, you know, accurate in this? I'm not sure. Okay, quickly, I have three more minutes, and I'm going to fly through the rest of this. Patroclus, Philip Sidney. Sidney wrote stuff for Lester. Uh, he wrote allegories and, and, and pageants to, uh, they were politically oriented to convince the queen not to marry the Duke of Alençon. So he was writing plays and allegories about that. And, and, and here's what Ulysses says, Patroclus breaks scroll jests and pageants us like a strutting player whose conceit lies in his hamstring. He acts like the greatness, Agamemnon. All our abilities, gifts, nature, shapes, achievements, plots, orders, preventions, excitements in the field or speech or for truce, success or loss serves as stuff for those two to make paradoxes. That one last line, that long sentence, that's kind of euphuistic. 
I kind of like that. Well, what about Ajax as, as Christopher Hatton? He's the guy that switches allegiances. Well, what about Hatton? How does he tie in? Well, his letters to Queen Elizabeth are full of pathos. Oh, I'm so dying, and I miss you so much. I love you so dearly. And they're, they're, they're pathetic. Uh, so what about, how is, how is this character, Ajax, described? He is melancholy without cause, and merry against the hair. He hath the joints of everything, but, uh, but everything so out of joint that he is a gouty briarius. Many hands and no use, a purblind Argus, all eyes and no sight. Argus had 100 eyes, OK? Um, and and, and uh, his, his uh, nickname was Lids, okay? So Hatton's, it was sheep and Lids, okay? And also, he was the Fortunatus and Felix, the unhappy fortunate one. So, uh, you know, merry against the cause, melancholy without cause. Uh, and Pandarus, of course, Henry Howard, he brought uh, the, he was an enemy of the Earl of Oxford, and he brought Vavasar to court, set him up. How about Diomedes and Sir Henry Lee? Well, uh, Henry Lee was the guy, the Queen's champion, and he ran the tower when the Earl of Oxford and Vavasar was placed in the tower. And within two years of that, Vavasar is having her second illegitimate child by Henry Lee, who they stayed in, in a lifelong relationship with. And, and they were very devoted to each other, even though Lee was married to somebody else. Lee could get away with stuff that Oxford could never get away, because Oxford was an Earl, and Lee was simply a knight. Helena Troy, how about Queen Elizabeth? Uh, beautiful, you know, you can go on and on. And Paris as Sir Walter Raleigh, um, who was the favorite at court in 1584-85, and who actually spoke up for Oxford. So, in conclusion, the characters in Timon of Athens and Troilus and Cressida, referenced in William Warner's Syrinx and Robert Greene's Godonius, are topical of 1584. Timon satirizes Oxford's prodigality, financial collapse, and exile from court, while Troilus is an anti-war satire directed toward the factional political crisis in England posed by Spanish aggression in the Low Countries in the mid-1580s. And I believe all that is in the memory of the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. This is from a plaque at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Thank you.